Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm uh, happy to see all of you here as the uh, new academic year gets started. It's such a cliche, but did not, didn't summer fly by too quickly? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dylan Bowden. I'm a professor here at the LBJ School, and uh, for our purposes today, I'm a, a distinguished scholar of the Scouse Center and executive director of the Clement Center. There are two host entities. So on behalf of both the Strauss and Clement Centers, welcome not just to a exciting and a fascinating talk we're going to hear in a moment, but really the beginning of our year-long uh, year speaker series. Um, uh, so before I forget, you'll be seeing, of, of course, uh, further announcements, but I think the the next one we have is Ken Pollock, right? Uh, okay, so September 19th, we'll have Ken Pollock from the American Enterprise Institute on uh, uh, Middle East policy, and then two days later, September 21st, uh, Kath Hicks recently stepped down from a very senior Pentagon position and is now uh, with the Center for Strategic, uh, Strategic International Studies. And so you'll be keep, a, keep those dates uh, free on your current calendars. But anyway, but uh, now uh, the main event, it's my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Moyer, who's going to be speaking on uh, his latest book, Opposing Foe, The Rise of America's Special Operations Forces. Uh, Mark is so prolific, there's about like six or seven other books he's written that he could also uh, speak speak on today. So if you get tired of hearing him talking about soft, uh, ask him about Vietnam revisionism or foreign uh, 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 foreign aid policy uh, or the Obama doctrine or any number of other things. Um, I first, uh, you, you can see his bio in the event announcement itself, so I won't repeat that, but I'll say, I first uh, came across this guy by reputation when I was working on the NSC staff uh, back in 2005, and our Deputy uh, National Security Advisor for Counterterrorism, uh, Juan Zarate, said, hey, Inbo, you're a historian. You've got to get to know my old college roommate, Mark Moyar. He's this great guy. We were roommates together at Harvard, you know, I won't say how many years ago, but a long time ago. And he just published this new book on the Vietnam War. And I said, ah, I love this. So anyway, so after the introduction from Juan, eventually I was able to, to meet Mark in person and I uh, value him as a as a fellow scholar, a friend, and a friend and a colleague. Um, he's currently running the uh, uh, Center for Diplomatic and Military History at CSIS, which is really one of the premier uh, foreign and defense policy think tanks in the world. Many of you will know that from, from Washington. Uh, so uh, he, as you heard, did his undergrad at Harvard, did his PhD at Cambridge, and then thankfully returned to America, where he's been churning out great scholarship and, uh, and uh, policy relevant advice ever since. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Moyer. Uh, yeah, great to be here. I've been at the LBJ Library a bunch of times, but have never actually been to speak uh, at UT, so this is uh, a privilege. Uh, and uh, this is also uh, a place that is doing a lot of the military and diplomatic history that is of interest to us, when other universities unfortunately are not, but uh, their loss is, is your gain. So I'm going to talk about the new book a little bit, give you kind of an overview of it, uh, like a lot of the other work that I do now. It's, um, I kind of lay out the history and then look at what broader lessons there might be. So at the end, I'll, I'll touch on a few of those. Uh, before I get into this, I do want to just mention one thing that uh, if you remember nothing else from this, if you remember this chart uh, and what it stands for, you will um, know more than most people, and you can sound very intelligent speaking around military people. So biggest mistake people make with special operations terminology is they confuse Special Operations Forces, or SOF, with Special Forces, or SF. Um, special Operations Forces comprises all of the Special Operations Units in the military. And if you look at US SOCOM up there, that is the umbrella organization. Under that, there are all the services have their own Special Operations, and there's also something up there called JSOC, which I'll get into. Um, the Special Forces fall within the USASOC, US Army Special Operations Command, and we'll get into them. Uh, the book itself covers this whole universe, so all special operations forces. Uh, so when you hear me talking about special operations forces or SOF, that uh, is the umbrella term that covers all the services. The special forces are Army. Uh, they're also known as the Green Berets. Okay, so I'm going to touch on some historical highlights. Uh, to understand Amer American special operations forces, you have to understand the British commandos, because they are the forerunners for many of our forces. Uh, how many of you have uh, seen the movie Dunkirk? Raise your hand if you've seen Dunkirk. Uh, quite a few. I actually, uh, my kids prefer Marvel, so I had to go see <laughs> Spider-Man instead of Dunkirk. But uh, it was actually after seeing the Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield version, it was actually a, a pleasant relief. So um, 
But if you saw Dunkirk, uh, you probably noticed um, they were they taking any tanks away from with them when they uh, left Dunkirk or any artillery. So while they get all these guys away, the, the British leave behind most of their heavy equipment in uh, in France. So when they're thinking, how are they going to deal with Hitler now after this all happened? They don't have a lot of heavy equipment. Uh, they also they don't really want to do this uh, attrition warfare again like they did in World War One, where they lost a whole generation of young men. And so uh, Churchill comes up with this idea of a peripheral raiding strategy. Uh, this is the middle of 1940, France is falling. And what they're going to do is instead of uh, you know, send, trying to send back a huge land army, they're going to uh, poke the uh, Nazi giant on the coast through peripheral peripheral raids. And the commandos are going to be a leading element in this. So this is an elite force that Churchill has created uh, to take part in this uh, raiding strategy. Now we get to America enters the war, Pearl Harbor ended in 1941. Uh, the United States is looking for ways to get involved in World War II uh, and to do things with the British. And since the commandos at this point are a big deal, uh, it's decided to form American units to go with them. So these are the Rangers. They're formed under uh, William Orlando Darby. And so they start preparing these Ranger battalions to help out uh, with the British. And one of the first missions they go to is the Dieppe raid in France. Uh, they're a fairly small number. It's mostly UK and Canadian. Uh, but that turns out to be a huge disaster. The Germans uh, destroy most of the invading force. And this really kills the raiding strategy. They realize that these raids aren't going to be very easy and they're really not doing that much harm to the Germans. So by this point the rangers are getting ready for this. So all of a sudden they don't have the mission that they were expecting to get. Uh, they end up taking part in North Africa, uh, which is relatively easy. Then they get to the Italian campaign. And uh, so you have this highly specialized unit. Its original mission is not really there. So they try to find ways for it to still be relevant and, and useful. Uh, and they use it in uh, a lot of the amphibious landings. And if you're familiar with the uh, Italian campaign, it starts in Sicily, uh, and they move up to uh, Anzio and Salerno, uh, and they're trying to uh, catch the Germans unawares, get, it, get in behind them and cut them off. Uh, it never really quite works out that well. But uh, the Rangers get assigned to some of the tougher uh, missions initially where they have to use speed and stealth. Uh, and one of those missions, so in, in the, uh, once they get ashore at uh, Anzio, uh, the, the offensive kind of stalls in the, for about a week, so then they decide they need to go inland and try to cut the Germans off. And by this time, the Rangers um, are actually, uh, have three battalions, uh, it's, it's grown through some successes in minor raids. Uh, so they're assigned the mission of go take this town of Cisterna. Uh, so they go on this mission, well, uh, unbeknownst to the Americans, there's a German armored division there, and the Ranger force, as it's now called, is, is pretty much completely wiped out. And as a result of this, the Ranger concept and special operations uh, suffer a, a huge blow to their prestige. Most of their units are disbanded, although they will continue to operate uh, in some other theaters. Uh, now, the Marine Corps side, this is also the time when the Marine Corps Special Operations Forces are formed, the Marine Corps Raiders. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had a son, James, who was in the Marines, and he was enamored of this guy, Evans Carlson, who was enamored of this guy named Mao Zedong, who seemed to be this uh, fashion guerrilla leader who really wasn't that bad of a guy. And so Carlson has this idea of forming U.S. units that are similar to Mao's Gorillas and James Roosevelt latches on to this and uh, tells his dad, "Hey, dad, I got this great idea. Uh, how about we do these guerrilla type forces?" So then he goes to the Marine Corps Commandant, and the Marine Corps Commandant says, "This is this is a terrible idea. Why would we do that?" So who do you think the president listened to his son or the Marine Corps Commandant? He listens to his son. So I don't think this is a new phenomenon. So the Raiders are formed against the opposition of, of most of the senior Marine Corps leadership. Uh, they also have some initial successes, but as we saw in the uh, European theater, they, after a few initial raids, they don't have much for them to do and they need troops, so they start to send them into conventional battle. Uh, these units are designed 
for rapid movement. They don't have a lot of heavy weaponry. So in the New Georgia campaign, they also suffer some very heavy losses, and they will get disbanded for the end of the war. Navy has its own units that it formed during the war, the Frogmen. And unlike some of the others, these are formed uh, purely because there's an actual mission for them to handle, which is to clear underwater obstacles, which have been a problem, which are a problem in some of the early amphibious landings. So they're trained to uh, go in usually at night to set explosives and blow things up. And at uh, both Normandy uh, and Guam, they're very effective in doing this. And so there's generally pretty positive feeling about what they have accomplished so that they actually don't get disbanded. Then we have yet another force, uh, the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, William Donovan. It starts off it's primarily an intelligence organization, but Donovan also wants to get in on the operations business and form his own special operations forces. The trouble he has is getting uh, commanders to, to put his forces in their theaters. It's, uh, they're pretty suspicious of Donovan, he's doing all his intel stuff. So uh, he goes to MacArthur and Nimitz, who are the major theater commanders in the Pacific, and they tell him they're not interested. So then he goes to Joseph Stilwell, who is in the uh, China Bur Burma India Theater, and says, how would you like it if I give some uh, forces to you to run? And, and Stilwell doesn't have much uh, available to him, and so he decides, hey, sure, as any good government leader who's short on uh, uh, assets decides, hey, I'll take these guys aboard. So that's where they end up going. The, uh, the principal special operations force in this theater is Detachment 101, which is uh, also known as the American Kachin Rangers. Uh, they initially sent in some teams to do long-range raids. Uh, five of the six of the initial teams never come back. Uh, it turns out they sent them into areas where the population was sympathetic to the Japanese and didn't like Caucasians. So, uh, but the one team that went in the Kachin area actually found that Kachins hated the Japanese uh, and had this charismatic leader. And so they go in, start supporting this uh, outfit, and uh, it turns out to be extremely successful. Uh, and that's the one part of the history that, that is most remembered, not the uh, failures. Then there's also the OSS takes part in the Jetberg program, which, uh, if, you, if it sounds familiar, there's also a recent reincarnation of that within our special operations forces. But the Jetbergs are small three-man teams that are sent into occupied France uh, during and after the Normandy invasion to uh, help stir up resistance and help the resistance units interfere with the uh, Nazi defense uh, of France. Uh, they land by parachute. They're relatively successful uh, in what they do, but they also, there's a lot of mythology that sort of surrounds a lot of this, so I use this slide to kind of point out the limitations on what they actually did. The, the little yellow bar there is the Jetbergs. Uh, the the uh, other two bars are other programs. The one on the right is the UK, so you can see the fairly limited nature of the Jetberg <coughs> participation. Uh, and also on the right there, there's also been uh, some of the Jedburgs have kind of tried to claim credit for you know, preventing the Germans from getting to Normandy, uh, but actually the, all of the resistance operations put together are really not uh, that critical. It's much more about the deception operations that are used to keep the Germans in the east, and uh, also the bombing campaign uh, on German lines of communication. So we get to 1945, end of the war. Uh, every single one of these units has gone by then, except for the frogmen. And as I mentioned, the frogmen are the ones who are clearly seen to have made a major contribution. Um, they will be downsized, but not totally eliminated. So, uh, and this is worth remembering, because uh, I think most people don't really understand how, how uh, poorly it went for these uh, forces, pretty much all disbanded between World War II and Korea. Um, there's a chapter in the book on Korea, but in the interest of time, I will skip over that to another highlight, which is the Kennedy buildup. John F. Kennedy is a, uh, another president who had a very high opinion of the Special Operations Forces, and especially the Army Special Forces, which he decides to boost. He decides it wouldn't be great to uh, create, uh, to quintuple our forces. The trouble they run into is that in order to experience that kind of growth, you have to uh, reduce the size or you reduce the uh, standards to get into these forces, and so you see a substantial decline in the quality, which will also erode the 
um, the uh, reputation of those forces. Uh, Kennedy also pressures the Navy into creating what we now call the SEALs, sea, air, land teams. Uh, Kennedy is very uh, interested in counterinsurgency. He thinks it's critical to defense of the nation. And so originally these units are mainly <coughs> focused on counterinsurgency in coastal areas, which is a good bit different from what they do today uh, to a large extent. Uh, Vietnam, all sorts of stuff goes on. I spent a lot of time talking about this, but the uh, and we can talk about it in the Q&A if you'd like. The important thing that comes out of Vietnam is that special forces take a lot of the blame for what went wrong in Vietnam, and I think a lot of this was not <laughs> quite accurate. Um, but they get a massive cut, and there's this ongoing jealousy between them and the rest of the military. SEALs get, get uh, cut apart, and uh, it's really, again, another down period for special operators. There's a lot of questions to whether they will even survive uh, Kennedy has built them up enough that they will be able to, but but uh, not so well. So, um, does anybody know what movie this is from? Airplane 2. Close. <coughs> Airplane 2, yes, somebody got it. So, um, <laughs> you may remember in, in uh, the 1970s... I was just to say that's one of my students. That, that tells you what we're doing in our classes, right? Good, so, <laughs> right, well... Um, <laughs> the, uh, probably showing your age, too. So, um, <laughs> this is... Uh, uh, hijacking suddenly becomes a big thing in the 1970s, and Islamic militants <laughs> are using this as a weapon. And so, special operations forces in a time of peace, and this for most of their history, this is common. They, they need to find missions to do because there there's not much for them to do. And if they don't find things to do, then Congress may say we don't need you anymore. Uh, so this seems like something that will be of use to them. So this will be. The hostage rescue mission, uh, there will never actually be that many operations, but it stimulates the uh, growth of much of what is our, today our special operations community. So the Rangers are brought back in 1974 to uh, uh, provide a, a capability to do this. Um, they are sort of elite per, uh, military <coughs> units similar to the early Rangers. Then it's decided we need an even more elite unit in the Army, so Delta Force was created in 1977, it's again focused on this hostage rescue mission. And then the Navy decides it wants to be as cool as the Army, and they come up with SEAL Team 6 in 1980 to do this mission. Uh, they do get a chance to uh, try to carry out the hostage rescue mission in, in Operation Eagle Claw. A ran hostage situation. Uh, the mission breaks down before they get to Tehran, which is mainly a problem of um, aviation units. They weren't able to get enough helicopters to where they needed to go, and then when they try to disband, they, there's this crash. So this is really a, a low point in the another low point in the history of special operations forces. But uh, but it actually turns out to to have some very positive consequences. Uh, one is that actually a lot of um, people decide they want to join the Special Operations Forces. A whole generation of leaders kind of decided to join after this. They wanted to kind of help make things right. Uh, but there's also two key new organizations that come out of the so-called lessons of, uh, of Operation Eagle Claw. So one thing uh, that they suffered from during this operation was that they didn't have an uh, organized command that was uh, there from the beginning. They had to cobble it together. So it's now decided we're going to create a standing organization. So the next time this happens, we already have this in place. And that is where you get JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, and then the other thing they uh, decided to do is that they need, instead of having these ad hoc air units put together, which led to these air problems, they're going to create a dedicated Special Operations Air Unit called the Night Stalkers, 160th Special Operations uh, Aviation Battalion. Um, this also leads to uh, the Nunn-Cohen Amendment of 1986. Um, does anyone know who that guy on the right is? What uh, what uh, 1980 movie he, he, he was in? Sam yeah, it is Sam Nunn, actually. But some people think it's Chevy Chase from Vacation. So <laughs> it's Sam Nunn. Um, and then on the right is, uh, is uh, Cohen. And they come up with the non cohen Amendment, which is on the heels of the Goldwater-Nichols um, uh, legislation. And so they take advantage of the momentum that 
created at that time to, to change the military, and, and they give SOCOM a bunch of, or, excuse me, special operations, a bunch of stuff that they wanted, because they've always felt like they've been kind of downtrodden, and that they're not getting enough, and they're getting stiffed in peacetime. So the uh, first thing they get is SOCOM, Special Operations Command, which is the thing I did, the slide at the very beginning, I showed you the umbrella organization, which is headquartered in Tampa. So now they have a four-star commander, uh, this is uh, one of the men that hold that office, is also the uh, chancellor of this university, as you probably know. Uh, but this is a big deal because up until this time, the special operations uh, officers are oftentimes colonels and lieutenant colonels. Uh, and when they get into a pissing match with a three-star general, there, it's pretty clear he's going to lose. Uh, so that's important. They get, the second thing is ASD Solik, which is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict. Kind of a mouthful, but this is also important because this gives them a senior representative in the Pentagon to stand up for their uh, issues. Third thing they get, MFP 11 is a dedicated funding line for special operations because they felt that, and, and rightly so in a lot of cases, that the rest of the military was kind of trying to short shrift them on budgets, so now they have their own money. And then the last thing they get is uh, a list of nine missions. It says these, these missions are uh, what Congress thinks you are responsible for. So things seem to be pretty awesome at this point. Uh, there, there's one problem with this whole arrangement, and that is that uh, the SOCOM commander does not actually control the forces once they're deployed. They fall under the regional combatant commander, COCOM as we call them. So, you know, Goldwater Nichols established these uh, combatant commanders, very powerful four-star generals who cover different regions of the world. So. Once something's going on in a region, it's up to that general to decide what special operations forces may or may not do. So when you get to the Gulf War, Norman Schwarzkopf is the combatant commander, and he, like a lot of conventional officers, isn't overly excited about these special operators. And so the SOCOM commander, General Steiner, has to go to him and plead to let his forces in because, uh, you know, in wartime, uh, a lot of civilians don't fully appreciate this, but usually when there's a war, the military forces are all eager to get in the action. And so uh, Schwarzkopf kind of gives him the cold shoulder. And so the, uh, the soft guys end up feeling like they've been marginalized once again because they don't really get to take part in, in uh, all the interesting stuff going on. So next milestone, up until 9-11 for the next uh, decade or so, it's very quiet for special operations forces, with the exception of uh, Somalia, uh, which is in the book, but I won't get into that at the moment. So 9-11, of course, fundamentally changes U.S. national security, and probably no one more than special operators are impacted by what happens. So one of the first things that happens is, uh, you may recall, um, I'm guessing by now most of you are, were old enough to remember that in your youth of Undergrads keep getting younger and younger. But um, the, uh, so anyway, we decide we've got to get rid of Bin Laden. You know, the, the Taliban won't hand him over. And the uh, Bush administration decides to try to start taking action against the uh, Taliban and Al Qaeda. Um, they turn first to the CIA and Special Operations Forces, uh, not really expecting necessarily to cause great damage. They're, they're going to mobilize the conventional forces. Uh, but in the interim, we'll do whatever we can to cause problems. So special forces here, uh, they go in on horseback with the, um, the leaders of the Northern Alliance. Uh, and with remarkable speed, with uh, help of pre precision munitions, they're able to throw the Taliban out um, in, in really remarkable victory. Uh, and this is uh, you know, special operations forces are suddenly again in the news and, and everyone thinks they are great and they've had this huge strategic impact. Uh, when you get to the uh, Iraq war uh, two years later, there is um, some sense that uh, you know, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld was so enamored of what happened in Afghanistan, there's some thought that we're going to do the same thing, we'll just send in the special operators. Unfortunately, uh, people say, well, you know, actually Saddam has a much bigger army and you don't have a Northern Alliance there. So, kind of finally figure out, well, yes, we do need to send the big conventional units. But special operators play a big role here as well. They, uh, the main ground effort comes in from the southeast there, but in the west and the north, 
the uh, SOF are taking part in diversionary operations, which are pretty <laughs> successful in getting Saddam to uh, hold some of his units there uh, and facilitate the fall of Baghdad. Uh, and it, as you may know, after Baghdad falls, there is uh, uh, some problem. Uh, there's some problems going on in Iraq. Uh, there's this insurgency that starts. Uh, SOF do take part, and uh, they play a leading part in the capture of Saddam Hussein. Uh, and for a moment, it looks like uh, this is a uh, you know, silver bullet. We've got Saddam Hussein. A lot of people think the insurgency is primarily sort of a Saddam phenomenon. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case, and the insurgency continues to grow. Uh, and so uh, we're going to have to stick around there. The uh, special operations forces suddenly find themselves with more on their plate than they can possibly handle. Uh, they are... Um, JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command Unit, <coughs> under General Stanley McChrystal there, Task Force 714, uh, really ramp up the surgical strike operations to an unprecedented level. You can see it went from 10 to, uh, to 300 per month, and McChrystal was really instrumental in making new use of communications technologies, uh, intercepted cell phones and com computers. Uh, there's also the other special operations forces, which we tend to call the white soft um, special forces, most of the Navy SEALs. Uh, they're also doing this kind of thing. They're so taking a massive toll, and I think a lot of people thought all these uh, high-value targets that are getting eliminated is going to defeat the insurgency. Uh, but unfortunately, the enemy is able to resist that, and uh, so we need more than just soft to finish that mission off. Uh, we ultimately do see, you know, initially there's a lot of friction between special operators and GPI for the general purpose forces, because uh, typically the conventional units are given responsibility for your territory, and the special operators might show up for a night and arrest somebody or um, get in a, a shootout in somebody's house, and then leave the problem for the conventional forces to sort out. So, uh, but over time there is a uh, much improved uh, relationship between the two sides, and uh, and this will be very important. And then finally, the defeat of the insurgents in 2007-2008. After that happens, then we've got a new problem in Afghanistan. Actually, it's not new, but it's getting worse. And so the weight of the effort shifts there. And by this time, you have uh, a perception among a lot of special operations forces that they've gotten away from their original purpose, which is working with local populations and counterinsurgency and local development, things like that, because what they've mostly been doing is these, these raids, these nighttime raids, um, pulling people out of bed at night and so forth. So uh, there's a big push to get them more involved in counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, and VSOALP is the main program that is used to do that. Uh, basically, they take a small team of special operators, put them in a village, and they help the village uh, defend itself, organize local militia forces, help organize local governance. Works pretty well, although it's uh, on a fairly limited scale. Um, while this is going on then, we have the iconic raid that gets Bin Laden, which is uh, SEAL Team 6, JSOC unit, goes in at night <coughs> into Pakistan. Uh, highly effective, no US casualties. Um, highly celebrated, I and mean, who wouldn't be glad to see Bin Laden gone? And uh, so th this will have a profound impact on where the U.S. goes from here. So you know, it gets played up, obviously very popular, but it ultimately has some negative consequences, uh, both for Shaw and for the U.S. more generally. Uh, so it promotes this idea that we can, through a single raid, uh, have some kind of strategic impact. Um, it also, uh, it, since it's done without the knowledge of the Pakistanis, Pakistanis are very upset about this. They, we have a bunch of special operators who were there. They all get kicked out of Pakistan, which is uh, a place of ongoing concern about terrorism. Uh, you know, we've been operating these drones there. We can't do that anymore. Um, so, uh, and, and if you look at kind of what happens in the second half of the Obama term, a lot of the problems we've run into, places like Yemen, um, Libya, where we thought we could kind of use these rays to solve strategic problems doesn't work out quite so well. Um, 
the, one of the most recent things to happen was uh, you know, software called upon to try to fix the mess in Syria and support the, the moderate Syrian opposition. Uh, I'd argue they were kind of given a, uh, a task that was doomed from the start because they were given these uh, constraints on who they could recruit. They said basically you have to recruit people who uh, want to fight ISIS but not Assad. And it turns out most of the people we wanted hated Assad and so uh, they were able to recruit very few people. Uh, you know, after a year, uh, the program comes before Congress and they ask how many people have been trained. Uh, it's 54, and then you know, how many are in the field? And four or five. It's, it's a, a devastating moment. Uh, program is shut down uh, after you know, spending 580 million dollars. Uh, so those are some broad brush strokes of you know, the history of special operations forces. Uh, I'll talk a bit about a few of the, the key lessons I mentioned. Through. Most of the book is chronological, looking through time. Uh, fortunately, we have enough experience with special operations forces in this country that you know, I think we can draw some fairly useful generalizations. Uh, so one kind of enduring theme is that the presidents, in many cases, are very interested in special operations forces, but it's usually sort of a uh, James Bond type of infatuation, and they don't actually know very much about them, uh, and this leads to uh, bad decisions in many cases. So um, you know, it's up to advisors of the president to kind of give them a more realistic understanding of what special operations forces can actually do. Uh, and you know, presidents, uh, a lot of presidents have not been interested in special operations forces, but the nature of our world today is such that they are probably going to find issues popping up that require the use of these forces, whether it's Iran hostages or um, terrorist attacks that require us to go after them. And so there is a, a need for presidents as well as the society more broadly to understand what, what they are all about. Uh, the other point about presidential leadership is that it can f uh, wane very quickly and so you have to be prepared for when that's going to come. The one uh, example on the left is Somalia, which we didn't really get into, but you know, after the failed raid that was in the movie Black Hawk Down, which you've probably seen, um, you know, President Clinton, who had initially thought Delta Force was great and they were going to solve the Somalia problem, he basically gives them the cold shoulder, uh, ignores them, does not really use them the rest of his presidency. Um, the map on the right is the uh, Afghanistan uh, VSOALP transition, where uh, as the war becomes longer and costlier than President Obama thought, he decides he's going to um, curtail that program. Special operators wanted to keep it going much longer and didn't think it was ready to transition uh, you know, by the, the end, uh, President Obama's interest in them has, has waned. Uh, the second set of um, lessons concern the roles and missions of special operations forces. Uh, you know, one of the enduring lessons is that special operations forces do have to keep showing why are they relevant, and that often means finding new roles and missions. Unlike, say, the Army or the Navy or the Air Force, which all have domains, um, you know, or Cyber Command, which has a cyber domain, special operations really don't have a particular set of missions that they can indisputably say are their own. And so there's this constant struggle to, to adapt and evolve, which I think in general is healthy because it forces them to remain relevant. Um, another point is that you know, historically they're going to have to. Uh, do missions in the next war that they probably haven't even thought of. Uh, if you look at the history of recent history of the world, almost none of the major wars were predicted um, by most people, and uh, they were required capabilities that no one had really anticipated, which requires you have some room for flexibility. Uh, the other point is that coin or counterinsurgency. Uh, the capabilities for that are something that, I, in my view, special operators should continue to do. There's been a few years ago, the uh, administration decided counterinsurgency had been so difficult and problematic in Iraq and Afghanistan that uh, you know we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, but another thing we've learned from history is that even presidents who say they don't want to do counterinsurgency uh, sometimes end up doing it. Um, you know, Vietnam, you know, on the left, and Lyndon Johnson, the last thing he wanted was a war in Vietnam. And George W. Bush, you may recall, uh, said he didn't want to do any nation-building stuff when he got elected, yet he ends up in Iraq. 
and Afghanistan. So we would, I think, be making a mistake to try to get think we can't do it anymore. Uh, third larger point in terms of the effectiveness, uh, there is a tendency sometimes to think that these special operators are so awesome that uh, we can send them into some strange environment and we know they're going to succeed. Uh, but the truth is that uh, usually things are going to depend mainly on the different actors, both friendly and opposing, that are there. And so before you send them somewhere, you should probably understand what those local dynamics are. Uh, another point that's, that's been an enduring problem for SOF and how we think about them, uh, SOF, you know, by their nature, can only be uh, a fairly <coughs> limited force in terms of size. And so, uh, example on the left is the Vietnam uh, program working with local militia, which was quite effective, but there was never enough special operators that this could make a difference on a national scale. You had to have other units participating. On the right there, that's a picture of Tora Bora, which uh, go through in the book, but um, small number of special operators sent in to try to chase down Bin Laden, um, but there's simply too a few of them to cover the entire Tora Bora area, and in retrospect, it would have made sense to send in much larger uh, conventional military-type forces. Uh, another point I like to emphasize is, by themselves, special operations forces are rarely strategically decisive. The, the one major case where you, know, you could make that argument is in the fall of uh, the Northern Alliance, um, or the Northern Alliance used against the Taliban, but um, Otherwise, when we've tried it, it usually hasn't been very successful and it's sometimes been counterproductive. Uh, and then the last set of um, <coughs> conclusions concern the relationship between conventional units and uh, uh, the special operations units. Uh, one point I like to make, and sometimes you know, special operations forces feel uncomfortable about this, but um, when you take so many of your best people out of the main organization and segregate them, you are causing problems for the rest of the organizations. Uh, and this has become a lot bigger problem than it used to because this shows uh, how much has changed since World War II. In SOF, uh, we're 0.05% of the force in 1945. Uh, they are now 5.0%. Um, and for those of you who weren't good at that, that means they're 100 times more uh, prevalent than they used to be. So it's... Um, when you have 70,000, a force of uh, 1.4 million and 70,000 um, troops coming out of there, it is, and I think especially it's a problem in the Army, which has the biggest uh, special operations component. The Marine Corps actually resisted special operations for a long time uh, for this. This was one of their main arguments that uh, you take your superstars and set them aside to the rest of your force is going to suffer. So that's something that I think needs to, to be part of the discussion. Um, the second point I make about this is that uh, part of the buildup we've had in special operations forces, which, by the way, they've nearly doubled since 2001, uh, but there's you know, often a perception that conventional war is a thing of the past. We no longer need these big forces. Uh, again, history reminds us uh, Iraq, we needed these big units. And, uh, I'm guessing right now there's a lot of people thinking about how we do something like that in North Korea. Um, and even in a counterinsurgency situation, as we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan, most of the counterinsurgency was done by the conventional units because the special operations forces were not big enough <coughs> to do that. Uh, and then the last point is simply that special operations forces and conventional forces generally work, to work best when they work together. Uh, and this is easier said than done because uh, Units like to do things by themselves, typically. Uh, and so this is a, a major educational point. And ultimately, this is something that has to be accomplished through um, gaining buy-in from the leaders of both units. Uh, it's not really something you can compel. So with that, I will um, wrap up here. And we have time for questions. How much time do we have, Will? Oh, questions?